And uh, in just uh, four days, the IMF uh, staff team led by its mission chief for Ghana, uh, Stephanie wrote it, uh, will end its mission to the country. They will have to be convinced about government's debt sustainability program in order to approve a bailout uh, Wednesday. Chief Economics uh, Officer and Director of Treasury and Debt Management at the Finance Ministry, Samo Dankwa Atkest, uh, says the country's drive to recover from the current crisis will be delayed and complicated if the IMF team leaves without an agreement. But with growing opposition to government's debt exchange program, the next four days will be crucial for the economy. Uh, we'll hear from the Associate Professor of Finance uh, at Andrews University in the US, Professor Williams. Uh, but first, though, uh, let's hear from the Ghana Insurers Association, which is seeking uh, an exemption from uh, the program. President of the association said uh, Casey uh, has been speaking uh, to join us about their concerns. We'll bring that to you shortly. But what we do know is that the Bank of Ghana has also issued a fresh directive uh, to banks uh, as it seeks to fast track their uh, sign on to the program. So, uh, what you have now. Uh, excerpts of uh, that uh, letter, uh, of course, uh, from the Association of Bankers. Of course, uh, it's uh, under the title uh, Policy and Regulatory uh, Reliefs for uh, Banks to Address Potential Impact from the Participation in Government domest Domestic uh, Debt Exchange. It restarted on the 5th of December 2022. The Government of Ghana launched the Domestic Debt Programme for a voluntary exchange of holdings of domestic notes and bonds of the Republic, including that of the uh, ESLA and Dache bonds, for a package of a new bond to be issued by the Republic. Now, the exchange includes tre treasury bills in totality and uh, old bonds held by individuals. Now, the Bank of Ghana encourages all banks to fully participate in the debt exchange program. Uh, the Bank of Ghana is also conducting a stress uh, test on all banks based on their holdings of the domestic public debt and has estimated a potential impact that could result from participation in the debt exchange. Now, to help manage these potential impacts and also to help preserve financial stability, the Bank of Ghana has designed the following uh, regulatory reliefs uh, for banks who participate fully in the debt exchange program to run. So here are some of the measures being rolled out by the Bank of Ghana. Uh, first of all, there's a reduction in cash reserves requirements ratio uh, CRR to 12% uh, on GHC deposits. There's also the maintenance of the cash reserve itself uh, of 12% on foreign currency dominated deposits to be held in foreign currency. There's also the reduction of capital conservation buffer from 3% to 0%, effective, uh, effectively uh, reducing the capital adequacy ratio from 13% to 10%. Now, new bonds will also be fully deductible in determining uh, the financial exposure of the banks to counterparties under Section 62.8 of the Banks and Specialized Deposit Taking Institutions Act. And uh, as part of it as well, we know that there'll be an increment in allowable portions of property revaluation gains for Tier 2 capital computation from 50% to 60%. And then finally, issuance of guidance on standardized uh, accounting treatment of debt exchange impact uh, will also uh, be carried out by uh, external auditors. So banks are expected to obviously submit some data on that and uh, there are more uh, directives that the central bank is giving on that. So let's take you through, of course, Ghana's position uh, at the time we last went to. The IMF uh, work by our research team shows we're actually uh, going the weaker now than we were back in 2015 when we started. Uh, so Let's uh, just get you a sense of what it is that we're dealing with in 2015. It's on your screens right now. Uh, so you look at some of the comparative studies there, talking about the status of selected economic indicators before an IMF program, uh, 2015 versus 2017. So uh, in terms of the indicators, look at our inflation rate, for instance. It was 16.76% uh, back in 2015, as of April. But the situation is really dire now. Uh, as of um, April... This year, we're, of course, somewhere around the range of 23.6%. Uh, it's even doubled because as we speak now, we're somewhere over 40% as of October. Uh, the depreciation of the currency uh, is nothing to write home about. Uh, quite close to what was happening back in 2015, 
uh, as of April 2015, it was somewhere around 16.9%. It's worse now, 54.2% currently as of November. But if you compare it to the same year on year uh, depreciation, minus 15%, that's how uh, much we're doing in terms of our depreciation. Uh, but when it comes to the GDP growth, we're growing a bit faster in 2015 of April of 2015 as compared to what's happening now. Uh, our growth uh, slowed somewhere as of April, but we're beginning to pick up at 4.8% uh, as of the second quarter. So uh, comparatively, slighter, uh, slightly higher now uh, as we speak, but it slumped in April uh, of this year. But for our domestic debt, which is part of the reasons why government is running the debt exchange program, uh, you find that in 2015, we're trade, I mean, we're around the range of 88.4 billion Ghana cities. But fast forward, April 2022, that has significantly shot up by over some 300 billion Ghana cities. So, and uh, of course, as of April, we're dealing with uh, a debt of 388.1 billion cities. Uh, the situation is worse now. There's an add-on of about 100 billion and we're shooting somewhere around to 467.4 billion so quite a dire situation for us as a country and if you take uh, the other profiles on the screens right now it's clear that we're going in weaker as a country joining me now uh, via zoom is professor williams uh, deborah associate professor of finance at the uh, andrews uh, university thank you uh, prof uh, for joining us uh, all the way from the united states so you have a clear picture of what's happening to our economy and you look at us now going to the IMF, and I'm just wondering if we'll first of all ever get a deal that fast as it's being projected. Uh, the projection is the first quarter of next year. Is that feasible? Thank you very much for calling me. Um, I think that uh, in a record time, um, Ghana will be among one of the countries that will be receiving um, IMF program in the shortest possible time. Um, from the time that um, the government admitted that uh, we are having some liquidity challenges leading to solvency challenges, or we or let me put it, the country cannot service this debt. Uh, we, the government did it in, in a very short period. Um, this has put some pressures on IMF, especially because they view Ghana as an important country within the sub-Saharan Africa. Ghana is an example for a lot of countries. So that is why we have seen that within three months, um, we have gotten to this stage of staff level agreement. And um, if you compare um, Ghana's situation to Salarion, to um, other major country, countries like Sri Lanka, um, our um, discussion duration has been the shortest. Um, so at this stage, um, what um, the team will be looking out for uh, that um, greater debt transparency um, situation, that is um, the country will be putting the full scale of our debt situation to the team that are looking at the books now. And Ghana must disclose all the debts we have in terms of debt owed by government, by government agencies, debts that government has given guarantees for, arrears that uh, uh, state treasury arrears that the government is owing agencies, and all these things will be pulled together. And I'm sure this is what has been done, and uh, that is normally termed as a sustainability analysis. And once this is done, the next level is. Um, um, contractual innovation activity. Um, this requires um, the government to be able to coordinate and talk to all creditors. And when we say creditors, uh, it includes people government owes or people who have purchased government securities, as we have noticed with the bond, the local bond market. So they are seeing what is a what government has done in terms of the bond. It's a mixture of debt reprofiling and debt restructuring. Um, government has reprofiled the duration of all the local bonds. 
and government has also restructured these debts in terms of reduction in the coupon rate or interest payments. The effects that we are seeing during um, contractual innovation is that um, you will see a lot of creditors or people who have purchased government securities like uh, uh, government insurance organizations, uh, trade unions, pension funds, everybody will be agitating that they will not agree. And they are not in agreement because it is going to affect in finance what we call the net present value of their investment. Or let me put this in, uh, in a simple way: They are going to, they were not going to realize the expected income that they needed to have should they maintain on the on the bond that they were having. So this is the the major challenge. Normally, IMF will, will require that the coordination activities with creditors will take about a a year, but our government has done it within. <laughs> By 19th of December, this must be done. So this is where we are having this major challenge coming in. That is why a lot of companies are, are see, or, 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 or organizations are saying that they will not buy into the government um, on restructuring and reprofiling agenda. This is really because these companies, these entities, they need time to strategize on how to mitigate their losses. But the way government presented it did not give them the opportunity to come out with that kind of reprofiling. So that is why we are seeing that uh, insurance companies are saying that this is going to affect them. It's going to affect them because their net present value of investment is going to suffer. When we come to the banking sector, luckily this time I'll, I'll give a plus to the regulator or the central bank. They have been able to come out very early to give an assessment of the banking um, sector situation. And so now it is, a, it is known that the banks are going to suffer what we call um, one. They are, in 2023, their income is going to be reduced because they are, no, they are not going to receive interest income from bonds. We know that about 56% of the bonds, local bonds are held by banks. And this is really going to affect the operation activities of the bank. So what the central bank has done is to reduce the reserve requirements, or let me put it, the money that the banks must keep anytime they want to do business. So the central bank is giving them some bit of liquidity to operate. A major impact of this announcement from the Bank of Ghana is the non-payment of dividend to shareholder, shareholders indefinitely. The word that they put there is indefinitely, which means that from 2023 to when the governor sees that um, the banking sector is solid and firm enough, they will allow shareholders to get dividend. This is really going to affect, one, the stock exchange because the share prices of some banks are going to reduce. Uh, a lot of people invest in shares or these banks because of dividend. So if dividend payments are not going to come, um, it's going to cause a reduction in the in the prices of of the bank. So I'm sure the regulator on the Ghana stock exchange may have to also pay attention to what happens there. Okay, Prof. Uh, well, what's your what's your impression, by the way, about uh, the debt exchange program as we're running it here in the country? I mean, um, so the current situation um, is very critical for government. Um, so. By June 2023, the central government was going to pay 43 billion Ghana cities in terms of uh, bond payments to local bondholders. This is the only, to me, um, a debt restructuring and reprofiling is the only option for the government. And that is what they have done that. Um, if, if not, the government will not be able to pay uh, these bonds when they become due, they will default. So. It is a strategy to come about with how to prevent a default. The indication is that um, general economic activities are going to um, drastically slow down. Um, we expect that companies that will buy into the, this arrangement um, will, will take some losses 
and which is going to really affect the operations. That's why I've, I've gone back to the point that they are, they are seeing that they are refusing to accept the current situation. Um, the, the structure that government has put in place by giving some kind of liquidity support to companies that will, will, will suffer major losses is also good. And it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a buffer to make sure that the economy or the financial activities in the country does not um, suffer a drastic uh, shutdown. So in, the, in simply put, government is trying to find a way to be able to um, structure its debt payments. And this is the only way I think that uh, they, can, they can do it. In other countries, um, these are the only strategies. You reprofile your debt or you restructure your debt. So um, this is also Jamaica use this approach and I'm sure it's something that will help them. All right then, uh, Professor Williams, Prepares Associate Professor of Finance at the Andrews University. Thank you for joining us here on The Pulse. We can now hear from the Ghana Insurance Association, uh, which is seeking an exemption from the program. President of the group, Seth uh, Klesi, has been speaking at the news conference earlier today. If you decide to go and buy a fender, the steering rack, the bumper, the f and in component parts, the total that you use to acquire it is in excess of the 32,000 you might sell a new vehicle for you. So it is indeed a difficult situation that we have to continuously bring out monies to be able to replace a part for our insurance. Our position on Ghana's domestic debt exchange is that in light of these issues that I've just put out, the accrued interest on government of Ghana bonds should be paid to insurance companies to enable them pay claims that have already crystallized. Insurance companies must be exempted from the domestic debt exchange. In uncertain times like this, entities must protect their assets through insurance, which is a key risk management. Apologies for that, but a Finance Minister Ken Overett has survived a vote of censure in Parliament but will he survive a revolution in his own political party? Well, that's the question on the lips of many uh, as MP for Anya Sotum, Dr. Dissin Adoma Kisi urges uh, President Kufano to honour an agreement he had with 98 NPP MPs to sack the embattled minister. After talks with the IMF and the budget is fully passed, the NPP MPs have come under heavy criticism after they walked out of the censure process uh, yesterday that could have uh, achieved the same Result, well, they've been defending their actions. As the speaker said yesterday, a path to censure procedurally and, and, and not, not, nothing concrete. And we've just tested it now. And it makes room for adjustment in our, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Not the, not the constitution person but even the standing orders that we use, you know, this would inform and advise us in terms of what we need to put down for censorship. And, and I think that my only thing is that the ad hoc committee should have had a very clear decision. And that clear decision should have been that the grounds were not proven uh, or did not stand the test of time. And, and, and that by that, they think that uh, censorship through this is not is not apt is not adequate it doesn't meet the the metrics of 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 all the threshold you know in in our in our local community if you are dethroning uh the sins that warrant dethroning a chief and i must say that the sins that they brought do not warrant dethroning a chief and and that is what the litmus test, I'm a chemistry man, the litmus test, uh, you know, was negative and, 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 and remains negative and history will be the best judge. But I really still think strongly that I will be on the side of history as a member of parliament for Anya Sotum that says that the censorship grounds did not meet the level that would have gained my support.
Let's speak to Kweku Asante, our parliamentary correspondent. Uh, and Kweku, it appears that uh, the NPP side is divided on what's happening. Give us updates. Kweku, if you can hear me, just give us updates on uh, the reports of divisions within the NPP side. Well, if you can come again. I I'm just asking for the latest on claims that there's division within the NPP side. So there are those who are suggesting that there are many NPP MPs who are not very happy about the decision by their leadership to have them to abstain or as it were just walk out of that vote. Some of them thought that they could have stayed on the floor. And even if the majority's thinking was that they should not vote for the stranger motion, they could have still voted against it. And that leaving while the stranger motion was being discussed was a bit awkward and it doesn't portend so well for the majority side. But of course, the argument by the majority leadership has always been that there's a secret ballot. And if MPs from the NDP side are allowed to go in there to go and vote, you may never know what they will do in secret. And so the party thought it's safe to simply just ask them not to vote. And so there's that kind of revision, but we are preparing over it to say that this is something that has already happened. We need to move on and we need to protect the caucus from some of these challenges. Uh, it's been a day after, of course, the minority side lost their votes. Uh, what's the reaction and the mood in, in the House generally? This morning, uh, the minority MPs, I mean, cutting up their majority colleagues and saying that what they did was shameful and that they did not put the interest of the nation at heart. They just went on to put their narrow political interests first by deciding that they were going to walk away from that boot. And so that was the kind of conversation that was happening at the coffee shop. It was around that time that I spoke to Dr. Adumak PC. He's a member of parliament for Anyas Utium, part of the 98 NPP MPs who say they want Kerofu Yata to be stuck. And he said that there are so many ways to kill a cat. Despite they working out on that stranger motion, they are hopeful that the president of the Republic, Kufado, mm. will actually hold himself in terms of the bargain they had with him to sack the minister after the IMF talks are concluded and the budget processes are wrapped up. Uh, is the minority making another attempt uh, at trying to get, achieve the same results uh, they failed at yesterday? In terms of the central motion, our understanding is that the minority leadership are putting any eyes on any plans to move any such new central motion. But they do not, I mean, completely overrule that decision that they could take some of their decision in the future. Um, Parliament is just set to go on break on the 21st of this month. But next, um, um, in January, when they return and the economic situations are the same, they are not ruling out filing another stranger motion. But they say that they are open to using any other means to frustrate the business of the, uh, the, the finance minister to ensure that he himself walks out of the rule. Well, Kwasanti is our parliamentary correspondent. You're still watching the polls. We'll be back after this break.